What up, Mitch? Hey, all. Y'all in the audience. Um, of course, if, if you don't know Mitch, um, Mitch is an Emmy-winning motion designer and art director. Um, he's done a number of insanely cool projects um, that we're going to talk a little bit about today before we jump into a really cool format that Mitch and I um, have, have been coming up with, which would be doing a live 60-minute painting here with you guys, um, with you guys helping us figure out some of the, uh, the key steps. But before we get into the live painting, Mitch, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, what you've been up to recently. Tell me, uh, tell me what's been some of the, the highlights. Oh, man. Um, doing tons and tons of work and then also traveling in the middle of that, so that's definitely fun. Um, a lot of the stuff that I've been working on is still, like, confidential. Uh-huh. But I've been doing a lot of um, stuff for um, musicians and things, which has been a good change of pace. Um, a lot of, like, tour visuals and stuff, mm -hmm. so I've been able to do a lot more kind of abstract work, which has been kind of more in my wheelhouse than what I've, had, uh, I've done in the past. Many people may not know this about you, Mitch, but you, um, you started as a musician, and you actually started doing tour visuals, right? Yeah, actually, I started as a musician. Like right out of high school, I uh, moved to North Carolina. Um, I slept in a studio for like three months, and then got in a band called Stained Glass Romance, and then um, was touring like nine months, ten months out of the year uh, for about like three years. So you were you were touring nine months out of the year? Yeah, it was crazy. Um, it was a really busy time, but also like a lot of the times we're driving. You know, throughout the whole day, playing a show at night, packing up, and then driving to the next to the next venue, and so I was bored a lot. So I started doing like merch design and stuff like that for bands. And then once I got out of that world, I went um, back home and got Cinema 4D and started animating and stuff like that. And that's just what I found my cover to. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of your your niche. Your workflow is C4D almost all the way, right? Almost all the way. I um I started in cinema, which I've heard is um, a very unlikely thing to do for motion designers. Because I hear like most of, uh, motion designers out there start in um, After Effects first and go through like the cool or um, animation, TV, and stuff like that before they usually jump into the three D world. But mm -hmm. I did the opposite um, and started doing After Effects for a while to do after cinema. And um, but I don't know. 3D is just kind of where I feel comfortable and it feels natural, so I specialize in that. Yeah, I mean, you have such a knack for taking abstract visuals into into a space and making them like have a really emotional effect. You know, I love I love your work. I'm gonna even just play your reel again because I I probably watch your reel. Full disclosure, I probably watch your reel 20 times now. Um, but I, I I love it, man. Um, and I think you your your work is so specifically stylized. You know, how long has it been that you've been in, in 3D? Uh, been about six years, I guess seven years in June, probably. Super rad, man. Um, so Mitch, um, I'm gonna, uh, I wanna show one more thing. So speaking of After Effects, um, if anyone has ever used After Effects, when you boot it up, you might have noticed this image coming on the front cover, which is Mitch's. So next time you, you boot up After Effects, you'll probably notice that uh, that it says Mitch Myers down there on the bottom, which I think is the coolest thing every every time I open the program. Um, how did that uh, How did that project come about for you? Yeah, it was um, the month that I was thinking about going freelance, um, and I was about to make the jump. I got an email from Adobe um, saying basically that they noticed my Behance profile, which um, luckily, I like started updating maybe like the week prior, just because I never used Behance or really anything mm -hmm. until then. Um, and they said that they, uh, I was their top choice to do it along with Jr. Um, I think that was the reasoning because I have like a really 3D specialized kind of um, style, and Jr. is really like 2D oriented, and it'd be kind of a cool thing to see like our styles mesh. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went freelance. The first first month I was freelance, um, I had that project on my plate. I had two projects for the mill that I was doing. I was working. Uh, I was I was going to be presenting at Seagraph 
for Cinema 40 in LA, and that was like all in the same month. So I was just like, it was already too much for my first month freelancing because I didn't know what I was doing to begin with. Um, and but I knew I couldn't like pass it up, so I just I went for it. Um, initially, we were going to try to make um, an animated um, loading screen, so like the whole thing would have like, this cool animation. But both of our our time frames and schedules were like insane, so couldn't do it unfortunately. Um, but it was sweet. Um, JR kind of did his style as far as kind of developing the initial um, like geometric shapes and things like that. And we went back and forth um, testing it out where he would create kind of this geometric thing in Illustrator and I'd bring it into cinema and convert it. Um, and then, you know, like we'd go through different backgrounds and volumetrics and stuff like that and eventually um, landed on the right one. And that was that. Mm -hmm. Super cool, man. Had you and JR worked together before? Did you guys know each other? No, not at all. I know I knew of his work. Um, he was a guy that I followed a lot just because his like animation is, is so polished, it's insane. Um, and so when I saw he was on the email too, I just got like super giddy. And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna get to work with that dude. Um, and then we had um, a little video call to begin with, just to discuss what our initial ideas were. were. And um, it just happened like really quick. Like we both were vibing on each other's ideas like right off the bat. Um, and we just like got right into it. I think it's probably why it turned out in a, in a way that both of us were really happy about. Uh -huh. um, so that, which is good because I'm my own worst critic and everything sucks. So to to feel happy seeing that every time I open up After Effects is very good because if I hated it, then that would be an awful time <laughs> to open After Effects every day. Playing um, Jr's reel right now on the side. Um, cool. Yeah, man. So such cool a pairing of styles that has, has come out of, of that work together. And do you guys, um, do you guys keep up? You think you'll, you'll do more together? I hope so. Um, you know, his style is, is a lot different than mine, but if, if there is a project that comes along that either I can see, uh, melding his style in with the, the client's, um, asks or vice versa, mm -hmm. I think we can definitely work together again. You know, I think it's, the freelance world is, is such a, a rite of passage for artists. You know, everyone goes from, m makes that jump as you were talking about, where you, you take your first plunge out there and you, you become your own boss and you become your own head of your own business, really. And I think collaborative partnerships are the future of small group business. And to, to you know, to find partners out there, like we see this in the chat all the time. A lot of artists who have met um, in the chat, who are in the chat with us today, um, have been working together and collaborating and we do um, of course what we're doing right now the KB3D contest um, where uh, artists can then post their work and be be actively seeking connections with one another and I think there's there's something so exciting about the freelance jump you know and obviously not everyone gets the the plunge in um, and gets immediately inundated with work like like you had um, but I think it's a, a really important part of the whole process for people. Definitely. I definitely consider myself very lucky to have the type of workflow that I've had going right into freelance um, and never experiencing that before. So um, definitely not the same uh, progression as everyone else, but it's, I've been very blessed, I guess. Yeah. Super rad. Um, well, let's uh, let's tell the audience a little bit about what we're going to do today. Mitch um, has come up with a new format, which I think would be really incredible. Um, we're going to do a live painting here with help from the audience. So um, you all out there, um, we're going to need some suggestions as we go through this. Um, Mitch is going to crack open C4D, um, and we're going to uh, we're going to build a scene, and Mitch is going to walk us through some of. Uh, the process that, that he has, um, particularly as an art director, when thinking about not just laying out the scene um, like a three D artist, but how how can he uh, tell and evoke motion through shots? Is that did I get it all right? Yep. Bang away. Right. Um, okay. Well, sweet. So then the first question I've got is we need to pick a kit for Mitch. Um, so we have uh, two options. We're going to go with either the industrial kit or the Victorian kit. Um, so, y'all in the audience, what, uh, which one of these kids you want? We're going to take a vote. Uh, bang, bang. All right, so we're in, we're in on industrial, and now we're off. Industrial? Okay, cool. Walk us through, Mitch, a little bit of your process as you're, um, 
as you're you're trying to find pieces and what 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 are your thoughts here as you break open the kit? When first breaking up this kit, um, I'm seeing a lot of uh, vertical lines and stuff just from the, the the stacks and everything. So we could probably use that to help um, help our scene composition um, depending on how we go about this. But um, I think first we need to know what type of genre that we're going to do before we can start filling this thing out a certain way. Good point. Okay, so a genre. We've got uh, we've got a new a new question for the audience. Let's go. Um, so we're in industrial. So let's say horror. Let's say I'd love to see you do something sci-fi with this. Get your votes in or or sci-fi. So we're moving on. So sci-fi it is industrial with sci-fi. So if you know now you've got a, a sci-fi scene maybe around a, a warehouse or some train tracks or. Oh, um. So. I'm going to pull up Google right now, and what I can usually do if I'm beginning a scene, if like the, if I were to have only sci-fi with industrial elements as what I needed um, to deliver to my client, then I would need a little bit more reference, especially when I'm starting to build this thing as, as a storyline and how my lighting should be and how my camera angles and focal lengths and all that kind of crap. Um, how that how that should be? I need I need some sort of reference to go off of just to help me out. Uh, usually for a starting point, so I'll look up some maybe screenshots from um, the type of film or or kind of mood I guess that we're thinking of. So sci-fi. Let me see what I can see. Getting a lot of like horror sci-fi kind of things popping up, which could be cool too. It's kind of interesting here. We just got this like top light going down. It's really dramatic lighting on our actual figures. Mm -hmm. and then we got our uh, scene kind of it's, it's directing your eye to the very center with these kind of uh, these vertical lines over here, which we do have with our Victorian kit and stuff. We have these not Victorian, but uh, industrial kit. We have these these stacks uh -huh. I mentioned earlier. So we could possibly do. Uh, composition similar to this, which might be pretty interesting. It's, um, it's interesting to me how, how you've talked about shapes and lines no, more so than anything else. You've, you've thought about how do we how do we build a composition using shapes, and then you found uh, a reference photo or something that, that just jogs your, your gets your, your it gets the spark for your inspiration. Yeah, um, because I mean, when you're starting out, which is this, which is like, you have like a huge, um, like head start to begin with, just having this pack. So, um, to kind of simplify this in my mind and see what elements might be better and how I should actually like, um, build this out. It's, it's a bit easier to kind of look at, um, some images as reference. So I'd be like, okay, like this kind of, I have this element, which might be good for kind of, um, giving this kind of feel and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's probably our best bet as far as doing something quick that we can do on a live stream and, and still making it like really dramatic and interesting. So let's, um, I just looked up the Blade Runner stuff. Um, this might be a sweet option too. Uh, I like the, the way it kind of gives us like a big world and maybe we can put some like volumetrics towards the bottom of the uh, building so maybe we can, can't really tell how far down the buildings go um i could give a good kind of trick to the eye mm -hmm. maybe make the scene look a little bit bigger and give some of that you know, distance yeah. atmosphere that you that you do once we get yeah. to lighting yeah and, and if we do have a bunch of little neons or whatever we decide to do um it, it could give a cool kind of uh, um, look with like the light um, bleed and everything from the uh, whatever we uh, create with the lighting. Um, Mabel 3D asks, will this be an animation? Um, great question. I think given uh, the time constraints, Mitch, is, Mitch has got an insane schedule here, so we don't want to take too much of his time. Um, so I think we're going to do a still image, um, but maybe maybe we could set some keyframes or something at the end and take a look yeah. at how, how you would make it motion. Definitely. Um, I plan to build this thing out, but build it out like I were to animate it um, after the facts. 
and usually when I'm when I'm starting a scene um, that I know is going to have animation or anything, I'm going to be building a still for myself uh, with a certain composition, um, just to kind of give my like mind a head start on uh, how the scene should be animated to best suit kind of the layout. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of like a uh, the uh, first step, basically, into my animation workflow. Mitch, while we're here talking about references, could I show one more resource? Yeah, totally. Um, so this is a, a site, um, film-grab, and I can pull it up here, um, and I'll throw it in, but if you if you want to search that, too, um, it's just film and then dash grab.com. And it's a really awesome site. What it does is, is it's got all sorts of screen grabs from all these different movies, um, and it's particularly sorted by cinematographer. So you can, you can pull it up, and it'll give you tons of different images pulled from that movie. So, and That's awesome. I didn't know about that site. That's sweet. An insane resource if you, um, you know, you want to find references fast. As far as the scene, I'm going to lose most of the smaller stuff because I want to I want to stick with the larger elements, but I might use maybe some of the cranes, um, maybe stick them on top of maybe one of my buildings just to get a little bit more um, depth, I guess, mm -hmm. depending on where I place my camera too. And maybe while while Mitch is sorting this, how about we in the audience um, try to shape a little bit of, of a narrative that he can build off as he's choosing pieces. So he said he he's got a uh, he wants to have a, one of the buildings with a crane on top of it. Um, what kind of uh, what kind of story can we see here? What kind of world? Something I like to think of in in all design really is the, the practicality, is the the engineering aspects of it. Why would people actually have it this way? I think it's easy to be obscure and abstract but being relevant is is a, another another more difficult task um donda says a heist interesting so we got a, a science fiction heist okay donda and what what could they be what could they be after maybe maybe it's a resource so we're in the future there we go yeah exactly uh hilliard and i had the same thought he goes this uh oh he says this is a nice resource for a factory um I was thinking, what if what if the heist is a resource? So now we're in the future, and Arthur says it's a deep mining site. We're going with that. And steam-powered cranes could use the output of the stacks, something that emits smoke after you discover it, says Arthur and Droki. Um, and maybe a salvage yard for robot parts, says Pondered Science. Bam, I love that. So we got a, this is a salvage yard for robot parts and with steam-powered cranes in a deep mining. Okay. So then, oh yeah, we got, we're, we're working on it, we're working on it. Spaghetti on the wall, we'll, we'll find what sticks as you're, as you're piecing this together. So we've got, in the future, when, when, when we've come into huge resource wars, um, and robots are running, the uh, robots are, are offering massive parts of, oh, what if, what if robots are doing the mining? So now we've got, we've got a robot-run factory here. Um, where the humans are out of it and resource is low. So now we've got humans who are going to try and break into this facility. So this is our big establishing shot to, to bring us into this world where our characters are then going to come in and try to rob the robot-run mining salvage yard with steam-powered cranes. Sounds <laughs> <laughs> pretty interesting to me. Um, and Mabel says a night scene would be cool because we can do cool lights, bangerang. So it's it's at night now. <laughs> oh, Hilliard says an early morning heist. I think we we've already committed. Um, <laughs> so we got a we got a night scene, and um, uh, we got a salvage yard going on. This is rad. Okay, so we got our characters are coming in here, Mitch. And what do you when you think about like a big establishing shot? What are the important elements for you? Obviously, something pretty wide that kind of gives you an idea of maybe uh, like what type of scene that we're in. So we obviously are in kind of this industrial mining kind of facility. Maybe we're on like a whole mining planet, and it's like a space sci-fi kind of movie or something. Oh, I dig so that. So maybe uh, you see a lot of uh, a lot of smoke and fog. And maybe we 
might do some like volumetric stuff or maybe make the volumetrics different colors to kind of get some pollution or something. Super rad. And as you're as you're picking these pieces apart, um, do you are you thinking about um, vertical lines being being a key key part for this for you? Yeah. Um, since we're using just these buildings, um, vertical is going to be the way to go as far as kind of leading the eye somewhere. But I'm going to try to make this crane um, kind of where our eye is supposed to go. I think I'm going to use a separate element that I actually downloaded yesterday. It's just like a little spaceship thingy. So maybe that's like our heist vehicle and get away. So what's what's this piece you've got here, Mitch? So um, this is my little spaceship model. Um, I'm just gonna quickly texture this thing super fast with Octane Render. Hopefully this doesn't slow down the video stream too much. Um, just gonna do something shiny that kinda can reflect the light in our scene. Glossy. Serial boosts the index values. It's kind of almost like a metal. Um, I want to add a little bit of film width to so give us kind of like this iridescent kind of look. Mm. It's going to be already reflective. And since it's going to be night scene, it's going to go ahead and make this just like a reflective black material. So it's not need a whole lot. Um, and I think I'm going to make a texture for my roughness. Um, and I'm going to use an asset asset pack from um, French Monkey, actually. The French Monkey is in the house. The stream. It's got these cool packs. I'm going to use one from the scratch kit. Add a light into the scene too, so we can test what these textures might look like. You do that. You do that often. Just throw it. Throw a light in the early on, just to to get a look at what you're you're working on. Yeah, if I'm uh, just doing like a uh, a little element kind of build, and I want to kind of see what my materials are looking like as I build it out, as far as the uh, what I'm doing with the scratches and things, and seeing if um, the scale is correct and stuff like that. Yeah, your your workshop light. Do something like that. See the scene. What if we do any animation or something like that? Mm -hmm. That'll be good enough for a live stream, I think. And I'm gonna add some dirt on my ship, maybe too. To let the audience in on it, I uh, we're doing a 60-minute painting, so I I started a timer when we when we got rocking here, so we are approaching our our 50-minute mark. So this is rad. So now you're you're able to you built your windows first, and then and then you you textured some of the rest of the the ship. Yep. Now I'm adding a little bit of dirt from. Mm -hmm. uh, Diffuse or glossy kind of dirty material and this base material I made for the spaceship. Added them into a mix material that um, is from Octane and added a dirt shader on it. Pop that in, inverted my normals, and now we get um, this cool kind of dirty look inside like the seams and stuff. Yeah, because these guys or gals have been on, on many a, a resource mining heist in the past and it's dirty work. And uh, and Trey, to your point about uh, about not rushing, I think I think it's a really good one. Um, Mitch, maybe you can talk about you know deadlines um, and how you know how how you work around those and how do you make decisions where you're like, hey, I, I really you know I could spend another week on this, but where where at what point are you are you making choices to to hit deadlines? Yeah, I think it starts from the very beginning whenever I get the initial brief from the client and what their um, what their budget looks like and if they do have like a hard deadline um, and where they want their deliverables set um, as far as when the uh, the frame should be delivered, when um, we need to have assets on lock, um, stuff like that. And once they can give me all that information, it's much easier to kind of um, understand like when I need to schedule my time out for certain elements um, for my build, and, and from there I can I can get the ideas in my head and be like, okay, no, that's not going to really work. So I don't have time to do that. Like, 
heavy volume metrics probably won't be a good thing to do in this um, because of render time maybe. I might do like a Z depth pass and do kind of like a fake kind of um, atmosphere kind of um, kind of blur something like that um, in After Effects to save time, stuff like that. Um, so it's all dependent on how well you kind of um, direct your client from the very beginning. It makes things a lot easier. And the client knows from the very beginning on what they're kind of getting into and what can and can't happen. Um, and it makes it a lot easier to uh, make sure they don't give you really dumb suggestions like a week before you're supposed to deliver the full thing because they knew that uh, certain things weren't a possibility um, and they need to bite the bullet on some things. And if they're happy with that from the beginning, it's um, they're going to be happy with the, the final outcome. They're not going to get any like any shock when they see kind of the, the, uh, the final final thing, and it's not really as high quality or certain things weren't a possibility, um, and they weren't expecting that to happen. It just makes it easier for them. Yeah. So now you're you're looking for your camera angle. Yeah. Now I think since we are going to do some volumetrics, I'm going to. Um, make my scene a bit smaller um, just because if I were to put um, like a fog volume in this, I would have to make it pretty large to fit the scene, which means more voxels in my scenes and my view for it's going to be mega slow and crappy. So I'm just going to pop these into a group. When, when thinking about an establishing shot, Mitch, um, what are the sort of the key elements that are going through your head? You want to you want to show the world and bring us into a space and sort of give the audience the the rules of the space. Yeah, I think um, the main objective of establishing shot is to to convey like the mood of the film or whatever it's going to be. So, you know, if this is like going to be a sci-fi film, we wouldn't want to start out with like a bright sunny day with like birds chirping sun rays through like leaves in a tree you know right, right. cheesy shit like that so we want to do something a little a little more gloomy or uh powerful and dramatic stuff like that so i mean that's that's definitely should be number one in your mind when you're um starting to establish a church you want to make sure no one's confused from the very beginning because that's not going to bode well for your audience it's almost like the pilot of a tv show you're you're setting the whole the whole character of the environment and right. what, what the rules of this space will be like. So, so much in, a, in an establishing shot, I think. You know, if you watch mm -hmm. so many of the, the great movies, their, their opening shots are, are so specifically telling you as much detail about the world as possible, or at least setting, setting an idea that takes you in. Definitely. Um. Establishing shot could be um, like your buildings, it could be your world, it could be just like a couple characters in a bedroom, but you're like establishing kind of the storyline and the mood and um, the vibe of kind of like where this story is going to like lead you. Mm. It's kind of like a title sequence too, because that's basically what the, um, the goal of a title sequence is, is to kind of... It's almost the establishing shot before the establishing shot, which is why I love them so much. Super rad. The, the establishing shot before the establishing shot title sequence. So, and now you're building, now you're building an, an atmosphere. Yeah, this is going to be my, um, my volume, like fog volume. Um, and so make this kind of, like a haze um, and I want these the top of these stacks to kind of be like peeking through most of it so everything else kind of like falls away mm. that would be kind of a cool effect and depending on how thick we make this thing um, and the volume step length that we use we could get a lot of different kind of looks with it let's just start um, experimenting with that why use a fog volume instead of an environment tag I find the tag faster good question um the reason I don't use an environment tag is because I, I only want my fog to envelop a certain area. Um, and especially the reason why I'm using it is because I want control of how um, far my fog actually goes up. Um, mm. And I can use that with this edge feather and how tall I make this, um, this fog volume object. 
I get a little bit more um, control over mm-hmm. what I actually want to do. Um, stick shift fog? What's that? The stick shift manual control fog? Exactly. So now maybe the spaceship to me is over here, maybe trying to like offload some stuff from this crane or something. Mm. I'm just hovering in place right there. So this would be kind of like where we want to lead our eyes. Uh, so now I guess we can just go ahead and try to get a camera angle on this thing. So go and make a camera. Jump in there. Let's see what kind of focal length we want to use. Um, I would think that you would want to use like a wide angle for this type of scene to make things look a bit bigger, um, which might be cool, but sometimes when I'm doing sci-fi stuff, I almost like a longer lens um, because I'm not sure if it's because it's just kind of what you see when you look at outer space, um, mm. like photos and things like that. That's interesting. Um, and so when you're looking at pictures of planets and stuff, you're not looking at it from like a 15 millimeter like lens. You're looking at right. something massive. So right. um, so maybe we pop it up to like 135 and we can kind of get this like really long kind of like down angle shot of it kind of it, it kind of looks like from a satellite mm-hmm. you know yeah, as if exactly. as if uh, uh, the security system of this facility is is managed by drones or satellites and they they're spying in it gives a voyeuristic feel to it definitely and um, you don't even have to like show that kind of like security side to it if you didn't want to like you didn't have you wouldn't have to like add any UI to the screen or anything like that uh-huh. um, you could almost give it as almost like a subconscious kind of thing. If people see that long lens, and it looks kind of like from like a, a God's eye view almost and stuff like that. They almost get the, the sense of that naturally. Mm-hmm. Totally. Um, which is pretty cool. You can like play tricks on eyes like really easily. And people don't even understand like what's happening to them. It let, lets us be the, the voyeur. Definitely. Um, so I'm going to choose like a pretty wide aspect ratio. Um, so I'm going to do 2300 by 1080. And when I take my my view down, my opacity on my uh, edges, you can kind of see what we're looking at here. So really wide aspect ratio gives a pretty like filmic uh, view to it too. And we can either um, set the scene up to where we want the center of our screen being our like Point of view, or we can do something natural where we try to balance our scene using the rule of thirds, which is a simple kind of basic film theory kind of thing. Um, you basically just split your scene up into um, a uh, like cross section. Mm-hmm. Let me see if I can find like a picture of it. I'm sure almost all of you have seen this before. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, let's let's dive into it. Yeah, we got this. Um, the little picture here, and this kind of represents the rule of thirds. Um, the aspect ratio is different, but the, the thinking is the same. Where we're cutting our scene up into these little squares. Um, and so naturally the eye, it, it feels better to the viewer if you put your your um, your item or talent or whatever that, that you're supposed to be drawn to in one of those cross sections in the thirds. Um, so that's where I'm going to try to put my little spaceship guy. If I just imagine this thing kind of being cut up into the rule of thirds, kind of just eyeball it, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you want your scene kind of weighted in that direction. Um, so you're just kind of drawn naturally to that. And we, you can see we have our buildings kind of in that direction, too. So when we have, like, these, these edge lines from our factories kind of moving in that, like, northeast kind of direction our eyes kind of start from this bottom area and follow the um, buildings up and we s- just run into our um, our spaceship automatically. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to do any searching. It's just very natural for the viewer. Um, and that you know, that's, that's what cinematography is all about. Mm. All these psychological tips that without, without 
telling us anything we know or we can feel that we're we're spying on something and we're we're moving into the future we're moving into the scene definitely like if you ever watched like a um like an indie film like the acting is awesome and you're like wow this is really cool and i really like this film but just something still feels off about it it's most likely something to do with one of the elements of film theory and maybe they're not following it at all or just not following it to um a higher standard like you would see a future film um and you can like easily tell it just like something's off like it's just not not feeling natural i don't i'm not like in this this world i'm not enveloped in it like i should be um so this is this is the key this is like the little magic behind it but find it so i'm going to do dutch my angle just like a little bit um and dutching an angle is basically um turning the the camera on its banking and so instead of turning it like uh to the right left up and down from a certain access point you're turning it um as in like a little roll and that kind of gives a sense of um something's not right or mm -hmm. a little bit off or but uh it, it gets a little intensity to the scene almost too um it's it's a pretty cool way to kind of automatically give your audience a sense of um anxiety and mm -hmm. weirdness uh without um being off guard almost mm -hmm. too off that off that sort of security camera idea it feels as though we the viewer were sweeping um to the left and then all yeah, of a sudden exactly. we've, we've come across something that's that's off that's not in that's that's in the wrong place definitely you can give your camera movement before you even move it it's like um probably the best thing that you could possibly do when you're first uh building the scene um and wanting to sell it to your audience like if, if we can get this camera looking like it's even moving to the northeast with our leading lines and where our ship is facing stuff like that you already you can almost put a story in head on where this whole scene is kind of like going towards without even seeing another scene at all mm. so now i'm going to start um doing some lighting and then from there we can go back to our volumetrics because the lighting is going to really um, depend on our volumetrics and vice versa. So we're going to do a bit of tweaking with that. Um, so behind this um, ship, we have this fan thing, uh, which is cool. But I'm just going to use this little circle here as maybe a, like my thruster kind of. While we dive in here, locomotive has asked, um, "How do you decide on composition devices such as using quadrants versus the rule of thirds?" It's really up to you as the artist. Um, you can. You can do a bunch of different compositions and still get the same feel, depending on how your other elements um, interact with, uh, you know, your camera and, and things like that, and where your um, where your animation is going. Um, but I think it's it it'll become more natural um, when you first think of what you're seeing in your head and where you want your scene to go and um, what type of elements you're working with. You're like, okay, like World Thirds is going to be perfect. This, um, um, I want my camera looking from above, so it's like high vantage point, things like that. Like, um, you know, it's all it's all almost personal preference when it comes to um, composition mm -hmm. and, and putting your scene in a, in a certain fashion. And, um, you know, as long as you do it right, I think you, you can't really go wrong for the most part. There, but there. when you when it when it feels off and it, it doesn't really work, you'll know it. Um, and then you just go try a different composition. And I think I think in the beginning too, it's really important to to experiment, you know, and to to use quads or to use a rule of third or you know to to learn all the different shots and learn how they make you feel, and then it becomes a matter of your taste. Definitely. Mabel asked, "Do you listen to music while working?" Uh, I do. Um, depending on where I'm at in my process, actually. Um, if I'm in the beginning of my process and really in the phase of thinking about ideas um, down to like the granular level, I usually won't listen to music because most of the time I kind of like you get caught up in the music and you get taken away and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then usually it's harder to problem solve. But when I'm just uh, in the zone, just building and, and you know creating art, 
then uh, yeah, I'll definitely listen to some music. So um, here you some of my live streams. You probably know that I listen to death metal most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> they have it, De death metal, Mabel. Uh, so you you set your you set your thruster on the back of this spaceship, and now you're gonna render out a blast to it. Yeah, I uh, I put an emission material on that little sphere that was part of the uh, the model, and that's gonna give a little bit of a thruster on uh, the edge. And you can see it's already interacting with our volumetrics. Mm -hmm. um, so let me keep working with that. And I think um, next we should probably just put some lights in our scene to begin with, and just see where our volumetrics kind of land. I'm gonna go ahead and make protection tag on this camera so we don't mess up our composition in any way and pop out of there. So when it comes to volumetrics and stuff like it's always a, a nitpicky kind of thing at least with me I'm always going back and forth between light um, power and density of my volumetrics and things and just kind of seeing what works and just to start I'm just going to make a area light and just use it. Did you set any um, any specifics to this light? Or are you just, uh, no, just yeah, trying to light it up? It's just a, a straight um, area light. I haven't messed with any so, of the, uh, the uh, settings on it yet. Mm -hmm. Right now, I think it's going to do something high up, angled down. I'm going to set this at a pretty small light because I want harder shadows. Um, just if, if we're trying to emulate the moon and stuff, um, it's a it's a big light source, not like the sun, but still big, uh, which usually gets you uh, soft shadows, but since it's so far away, um, you're going to get hard shadows from it in real life. So we can kind of invert that in this world where we don't have to send a light source way in the back. We just make it small. Mm. Um, and since we have a small scene too, it's not like we need to uh, illuminate a big wide area, so we can kind of get away with this anyway. We're still going to get the harder shadows. So now I can go into that light settings. We start to light a little bit. And then go back into my camera and see kind of what this is looking like. And I don't have any textures on my, um, my buildings or anything. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get to it or not, but we can at least get an idea of what a composition would look like mm -hmm. um, and light for it and stuff like that. So and we'll make it look as cool as we can. Maybe we'll just do black and white. Oh, that's a cool idea. Um, so let's see. So that's looking cool. It almost looks like a Z depth pass uh -huh. <laughs> with our, with our uh, yeah. fog kind of getting this gray gradient on our, on our uh, elements. I'm going to make a floor on this thing too. Take my temperature up to 12,000. So it's kind of this bluish light. Mm -hmm. Again, if we go black and white on this, it's not going to matter, but just so I'm happy with it. Go do. Um, so let's do maybe some, some lights on the edge of this building. Since uh -huh. this feature, like maybe we just kind of have, you know, how like landing, um, like totally, I was uh, just landing about zones that. and airports mm -hmm. and helicopter kind of things always have these little like lights, uh -huh. so pilots can see them at night. Maybe we can just do this to here. I, these little bit things. Maybe in the future, everything needs lights on the top of it, so like spaceships. Don't so spaceships don't crash into it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, lo I love how you have the spaceship slightly askew yeah. to to the runway, so it lets us know that that we're you know, it's, it's not the traditional place. It's going off the beaten path. You know, our heroes or whoever we're, we're following here are, are going against status quo. Yeah, like, it's 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 good to make everything as natural as possible. Like, if there was a spaceship kind of hovering, um, it wouldn't be, like, like 100% at 90 degrees uh -huh. and, like, perfectly banked and stuff. So it's, to, it's good to kind of, like, just make things a little off-axis. It's just, it's just more natural. Mm-hmm. Now I'm just going to make a sphere really quickly, and small, 
and I'm going to put it into a cloner. And now it's cloning up. So I'll go into my cloner and take off the Y and put this clone in the Z space. So, or on the, uh, the X axis, actually. And then I'll just line it up on my building. Vita Ron Raid says everything looks so easy for Mitch. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's all with practice and basically not doing anything else. <laughs> <laughs> all right, sweet. So I got my lights on this building. Made them uh, kind of this red color. Maybe we'll make the engine more blue. So it kind of contrasts mm. with the red lights on the building. Mm -hmm. So like. Color combos are another kind of film theory thing to follow um, with. You can even like lead your eye with color, which is interesting. Um, warm and cool tones are always like a cool combo, especially when telling a story of like light and dark. Sometimes even um, DPs and uh, cinematographers will s just color different scenes in a different color. Um, maybe even like two different colors. So when you're in like a scene with like a villain, their uh, scenes are always going to be kind of like green or red tinted. And when you're in like the hero scenes, it's always going to be kind of blue, white, blue and white, stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's as easy as that to, uh, to create something interesting with light to tell a story. Have you seen Color Palette Cinema on Instagram? No, um, that sounds interesting. I'm, I'm going to put it into the chat. Um, for, for anyone who wants to check it out, um, super cool Instagram where they they show uh, a screen grab of a movie and then they show the color palette used in like almost swatches. Color palette cinema, really cool Instagram. Um, if y'all want to check it out, when talking it's about not. colors and what what palettes can set moods and what what colors mean to us, you know. I'm messing with my volume step length, which is basically um, is going to tell Octane how much light can actually escape this volume. And so you can see, um, you can basically not see anything <laughs> except for that crane kind of like sticking out. Uh -huh. uh, which is with the uh, the type of kind of idea that I was thinking of wanting to do in the first place. So I'm going to take down the density a little bit so we can start seeing some other elements. Um, and we're going to start getting something pretty interesting. So we're getting like a lot of light spill from our uh, engine in the, the spaceship. And we can probably take down our uh, our moon light just because our light's kind of being washed throughout the, the volumetrics. Now, so we can get a bit brighter mm -hmm. in our scene. We can also manage that with our, uh, our camera too as far as um, our uh, brightness and um, dense, or, uh, our uh, camera imager our gamma and stuff. Um, so let's see. Now I think uh, we're getting a little bit of light spill from these lights, but not as much as I want, so I'm just going to take those up a notch. It's cool, though. Already we're, we're immediately getting the, the volumetric feeling of, of sneaking somewhere we're not supposed to be, somewhere that it's, you know, that humans typically aren't. And um, since we know we're not really going to be able to see our uh, our floor anyway, we can move these buildings around um, to suit our needs. So maybe I want to see this building a bit more. Or uh, maybe I want to move a stack even to this side so we mm. can see something sticking out here. Mm -hmm. um, and even though we're, we're losing a lot of our, our leading lines with this fog, we still have these lights here to kind of help us out. So what I'm going to do just to fix that, I'm just going to wing it and copy this building. Jump out of my camera. Move this around. Super cool. Oops. Work. And then I'll just move this to where I want it. You could have like a scene that's like looks just god awful in your viewport, but if you have like the right volumetrics and kind of hidden features in the actual render, it really doesn't matter. Mm. And 
just by like copying that we got like even a more interesting kind of like factory layout yeah so, totally now we're getting kind of these pipes mm -hmm. sticking out and maybe um something in the foreground as far as a pipe uh, just to maybe kind of block your eye from the scene and even direct your eye a little bit more. Mm -hmm. so then um, I'll probably just go ahead and copy this again. Move that down. Oops. Uh, and then we'll jump in the camera so we can start ah. seeing where to place this. I love that you're able to see the, the top of the pipe too. Maybe you could. Yeah, it's, it's like super interesting when mm -hmm. you get into this kind of really deep fog and stuff. Let lets you know that there's there's some kind of something coming from from the from the ground up. You know? Yes. Those vertical lines right. that you talked about in the beginning. It could be like a whole another world uh, below the fog. Uh huh. Here. Oh, that's rad. Yeah, it's starting to look pretty cool. Uh huh. Just a little bit. And so now, when we, uh, if we animate this, we'll get a little bit of a uh, parallax between the foreground uh, stacks and the the uh, stacks closer. Yeah. Or uh, in the background too, which will give a little more interest to it. Um, what else can we do? Maybe we can, let's see. I think putting a light in this kind of area, it would be something good just to balance it a little bit more. Mm. We'll do something pretty, pretty dim, but just still showing that there's something over there. And I think doing another uh, reddish type light would be good. So uh, let's just go ahead and get another area light. Make it facing upwards, maybe. Scale small. I'll bring down. Maybe there's something happening over here, and uh, make sure that this actual light isn't visible to the camera, just the emission. And we will bring our temperature down. But that looks like. So now we're kind of just in like the trial and error stage where we're just fiddling with lights and the volumetrics. We got the composition, so that's kind of locked in, but just kind of seeing how different things react to different um, different areas. Mm -hmm. and just kind of making sure that things are fitting correctly. Maybe I'll just take this light. Off. Look in. Like that. Maybe we can just get kind of like a little bit of the edge of this building here. Maybe we even take this light. Oh, just mean that gets long, so maybe we get some spill onto these stacks too. Cool. Now I'll mess with the power. And uh, I mean, we can even like throw a simple shader on our uh, our mesh for the buildings just mm -hmm. to get something very simple. Maybe it's kind of like the fog. Maybe it has a lot of like moisture in it or something like that. So maybe our like buildings are always wet or something. Uh -huh. We can make it really glossy and it'll bounce around the light a little bit more too, make it a bit interesting. I'll do darker texture, make it glossy, a little roughness to it. And again, this is just like a simple texture and we're just going to see how the light plays. Just pop that on all of our stuff. It's gonna change like wildly. It's not gonna look anything like this. <laughs> it's a bit harder to see um, actual crane, but once this thing kind of cleans up as far as the, uh, the 
the volumetric and stuff. We're getting a lot more like reflection from this, uh, this side light over here on these pillars. Um, and our crane is going to be lit up a bit more. I think it might be better. I might um, take this light, boost up just a little bit, maybe add another light towards the bottom left just to kind of like center up. Mm -hmm. Our scene with the lighting. This may look like total crap, which it does often. Like I'll, I'll like, oh, light here, light here, light here, light here, um, and in my head it sounds like a good idea until I actually see it. I'm like, oh, you know, let's go and just take all that out. And it's never a bad thing to build up your scene and then start taking a bunch of things away and just seeing what works and what doesn't. So then you're you're leaving the top of the crane out of the texture. Is that is that why we can't see the top of the crane? No, it's in the texture, which is part of the reason we can't see it because I got this darker, um, glossy texture on it, which we can always um, boost the uh, either the index value or just make the the fuse a little bit lighter. Mm. I want to try to get the light bouncing a little bit more. All right, let's uh, let's finish this thing up then. Oh, and, and we got to come up with a name for this movie. Um, oh, yeah. we, uh, we got mineral or, or resource thieves in a industrial planet. Who are they? What are they? Well, we know who, we know what they're doing. What's, what's the name of this? Uh, and, and, and Rick's, we still need more chimney sweeps. You know what? I think what's going to happen, Rick, is, um, is after, uh, after this spaceship takes off, that's when the full chimney crew will come out and the full opening musical number will, will really take effect. <laughs> <laughs> I can uh, let's let's try to mess with putting some some smoke coming out of the stacks maybe for the first like six minutes. Let's see what that looks like. Um, so I'm going to use turbulence FD, um, which I just started messing with. <laughs> so let's see if I can do this. Droki brings up a really good point. He goes, I can't believe Mitch is able to talk while he's working through all these complex issues. Um, and I, I, I'm amazed by that too, Droki. Thanks, man. I like talking, so it's easy. <laughs> so if you use Turbulence FD, what I'm doing right now may look totally stupid because I technically still don't know what I'm doing. Um, we're going we're gonna to see what happens. Oh, yeah, I need to create a this. We got some titles offered up. Pondered Science says The Coalition. I like that. Dondatron's got Heist Bash 2, Attack of the Clones. Yeah. I, I like that this is a sequel. I don't know why, yeah. but I I like that we've made a franchise here together. Maybe right. this is... At least it's good enough, the story's good enough to... People can already see a sequel. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, there was, there was an amazing... Amazing setup to this, an earlier movie. Yeah. People loved. Maybe we call this Heist Bash 2, The Coalition. Heist Bash 2. We, we'd, bash, we'd bash your names together. Rick, Rick likes Titanic 2. It's an huh. interesting point. <laughs> Sweet. So this last 10 minutes is Mitch trying to figure out how to do something that she probably already know how to do. <laughs> I think that should have got this program a long time ago. Well, that's encouraging to know. Even you <laughs> are uh, are learning new things and working through stuff on the on the go. Totally. Oh yeah, I need to go to rendering density thickness up maybe. So I'm missing. I think I'm missing just something as far. I got my density. Rendering is density because I just want to create smoke. I don't need any heat or temperature or nothing. So it should be. JD says, uh, don't you have to animate the ball? And Louis 4D says, in the emitter tag, you have to set a number in density. In the emitter tag, number in density. Oh, yes. Let's see if that goes along. Yay, it's going the wrong way though. But we can fix that. Cool, hell yeah. Bam. Point one for you. Right on, Louis 4D. 
three pointer at the buzzer. <laughs> which might just make us push a little over time. That's <laughs> right. Oh man, look yeah. at that. There we go. And uh, I'm gonna have like turbulence or vorticity. <laughs> Some of that, maybe. So now I'm just messing around because I, I haven't messed with it enough to like know exactly how this is gonna look, but let's see. This is like the fun part. Wow. Yay. Yeah. Like some really icky looking stuff right there, which might be cool for our weird little planet. And I could do like a collision on our factory thing to where it collides with our actual stack and stuff, but we won't go that deep into it right now. Um, maybe uh, let's do some timing and take down our time scale. Let's see that. So we're nine, so. 90 seconds, Mitch. Okay. Um, so, yeah, quick and simple way to create, I guess, some smoke coming out of a stack using Turbulence FD and a person from the chat. There we go. Yeah, Louis 4D <laughs> hooking it up. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, so I think, uh, I think we can stop here.